Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Anjali Njeti, presenting her debut novel, The Parted Earth, in conversation with Michelle Bowdler. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community. Every week, we are hosting events here on our Zoom account. And this month, we will feature events with Maggie Shipstead in conversation with J. Courtney Sullivan, E.C. Osundu in conversation with William Pierce, and Francisco Goldman in conversation with Colm Toybean. Please check, uh, please check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of The Parted Earth on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of the series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Cambridge. We thank you so much for showing up and tuning in, both in support of our authors and of the truly incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings like these technical pardon me, technical issues may arise. Uh, we hope they don't, of course, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce our speakers. Anjali Njeti is a former attorney, journalist, and activist. Her work has appeared in the Boston Globe, Washington Post, Al Jazeera, Paris Review, and The Nation, among other publications. Her essay publication, Southbound, Essays on Identity, Inheritance, and Social Change is forthcoming from the University of Georgia Press. She teaches creative nonfiction in the MFA program at Reinhardt University. Michelle Bowdler is the Executive Director of Health and Wellness at Tufts University, and after graduated from the Harvard School of Public Health, she has worked on social justice issues related to rape for over a decade. She is a recipient of a 2017 Barbara Deming Memorial Award and has been a fellow at Ragdale and the McDowell County. Pardon me, McDowell Colony. Michelle's writing has been published in the New York Times and her essays, Eventually You Tell Your Kids and Babylog, were nominated for Pushcart Prizes. Tonight, they'll be discussing Anjali and Jetty's new novel, The Parted Earth, which follows three generations of a family grappling with the aftermath of the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan. Author Laila Lalami praises in Anjali and Jetty's deft hands the story of a woman's search for her grandfather and her connection to the ancestors is brought to life. I'm so pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Anjali and Michelle. Thank you very much. And uh, my name is Michelle Bowdler. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm going to be the discussant tonight and I am so excited to be here with Anjali and honored uh, to uh, be with all of you. And in fact, Southbound has come out and it is uh, an incredible uh, series of essays. And the cover says essays on identity, inheritance and social change. And I highly recommend it. It is uh, brilliant and um, really discusses some of the most urgent issues of our, of our time. And, um, and also, as you can see, The Parted Earth, I have a matched copy to Anjali's. Uh, and I just, I just wanna say a couple of things and then I'm gonna ask Anjali to read a little bit and then we'll start our conversation. This book is really uh, a phenomenal book. Uh, the characters, the story, um, I couldn't put it down and I just feel so happy that we're here to discuss it tonight. And so that's enough from me. Um, Anjali, welcome. Uh, welcome to Virtual Boston and to Harvard Bookstore. And I'm gonna start 
our, we're going to have a conversation, but I think it would be nice for people to just hear from you and hear a small uh, snippet from the book, and then we'll begin our conversation. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you to Nell and everyone at Harvard Bookstore uh, who have been weathering this global pandemic. I have such an appreciation of everybody who has who have been keeping these independent bookstores uh, open and available to readers and authors. So thank you all that you do. Um, I'm going to read a short excerpt from The Parted Earth, um, but first I'd like to give you a little bit of information about what I'm reading. Um, the novel takes place over 70 years, and there are three different parts, and they uh, occur on several different uh, continents, in several countries, in parts of the world, and in several decades. Um, one of the main characters, her name is Shanti Johnson. She goes by Sean. For most of the novel, she's 41, 42 years old. Um, she uh, has a grandmother named Deepa, who is 16 at the beginning of the novel and living in New Delhi during 1947. Um, but uh, Sean is estranged from this grandmother in the year 2016. Um, and, and is essentially also estranged from her Indian heritage because um, her father, who is the one Indian parent that she has, abandoned her at age five and then passed away when she was 11. So the section I'm gonna read to you right now actually takes place in the 1980s at the Taj Mahal in Agra in India. And this is the one section where we see Sean at a different time in her life. She is 10 years old. Her father has picked her up from her mother's house in Seattle and has brought her on her very first trip to India. And uh, it's a little awkward for Sean. She does not see her Indian father very often at all. And uh, at age 10, she's becoming a little bit more independent um, and sort of questioning a lot of things that adults do. Um, and so this is a scene between her and her father from Sean's point of view at age 10 at the Taj Mahal. Her mother's skin was a creamy white, like almost everyone's in Seattle. Sean had to claim or be claimed by her mother to prove they shared genes. Complete strangers would ask Sean, oh, are you adopted? They asked her mother, is she your stepdaughter? Here in India, Sean could see herself in her other parent, could match her skin to the skin of so many others around her. For the first time, she looked like everyone else, even though every Indian seemed to know she was an American. Sean and her father joined the crowd and followed along the path. With each step, the dome sprouted higher into the bright, cloudless sky. Its girth widened. When they finally reached the platform, they began a steep ascent. On the terrace, her father pivoted her body, directed her gaze along the banks of a shallow river. See there? It's called Agra Fort. In the distance, red cylindrical towers kissed low-lying clouds. Walls like decorative curtains strung them together. That's the palace where Emperor Shah Jahan ruled India, he said. When Mumtaz died, he built the Taj Mahal here so he could watch over her from Agra Fort. When he died, they entombed him here with her. He paused. Isn't that a lovely thought? He never wanted to be apart from his wife. The truth of his statement stung. The emperor had never wanted to be away from the queen, but her own father had gone as far away from her and her mother as he could. I never knew my father, he said. His gaze locked on hers. Did I ever tell you that? The words fell out of his mouth, landed with a thud between them. His father her grandfather. She knew this, though how she came to know it escaped her. She always seemed to know about this absence in her father's life, much the same way she always knew about her own father's absence in hers. I've no idea what he even looks like, he continued. I think about him every day, though. Her father had
had seemed oblivious to the fact that they shared this kind of sadness of missing fathers. She wanted to shake him in that moment. His decision to move to India without her had been a selfish one. He still did not see it as such five years into his relocation, was wholly unaware of how his absence continued to hurt her, how it made her feel so lonely. For her eighth birthday, he had mailed her a globe, the earth parted by latitudes and longitudes, oceans and continents. She had measured with her hands the distance between Seattle and India. Nine hands. The sun never shone on them at the same time. He had moved so far away from her, he might as well have moved to the moon. When he lifted his face, his gaze traced the horizon, settled back on Agra Fort. Nothing makes me happier than having you here with me now, he said. No one has ever meant more to me than you. She smiled, her first of the day. If these rare moments were all they could ever have together, maybe it would be enough. Oh, that was, that was beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. I think that really does, um, it grounds me in the conversation as well. Um, and, it, and it really does give us a sense of, of what's to come. And I, I have a question, but I, I wanna mention that uh, the way you build characters and what their challenges are gonna be um, so, so deftly and so quickly in the novel really uh, helps really, really engages the reader uh, immediately. So I just, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, the question I have for you is, uh, tell us, tell us more about why, why, part, why the partition story sort of, and, you know, what, what compelled you to tell this, this story in your novel? And Absolutely. Um, so I grew up like many people in the United States, not knowing a whole lot about partition. I knew a little bit about it. I knew that for a couple hundred years, the British controlled India. Um, first as the East India Company, and then later as, as the Crown, the British Raj. Um, and I knew that at some point there was a quit India movement where uh, Indians mobilized to push the British out and that Gandhi was one of these leaders. I didn't know a whole lot after that. I knew there was some violence and then I knew that the British drew a line in the sand to divide uh, this land, uh, this subcontinent into two nations, two new nations. Um, one, the Hindu majority, uh, India, and uh, the second, uh, the Muslim majority of Pakistan, which was, then it was East Pakistan and it was West Pakistan. So two, two parts of the land, but one, one nation. Um, so, after college, I graduated in 1995, um, was on my way to law school. I decided that I was going to start reading books about the partition. Um, I was in St. Louis for a couple of years, had a favorite indie bookstore there, which sadly has since closed, but I started purchasing novels uh, about the partition there. Um, and then I ended up in Philadelphia a, a few years later. Uh, got a job at, uh, in Wilmington, Delaware, and there was this wonderful downtown public library across the street from, my, from where I worked. Um, and I started going to the library on my lunch break and just checking out any book I could find about partition. At this time, I was not a writer. Um, I, I was just a reader. I was fascinated by this uh, period in history and every book I read made me want to read more. Um, eventually, I went from reading fiction to reading nonfiction. And uh, the more I read, the more I just couldn't believe uh, that I didn't know so much about this period of history, which is really significant, not just for people with South Asian origins, but really it's a world event, right? It was, it, it was a world event to the same degree that, that uh, Hiroshima was and the Vietnam War and World War II and the Holocaust. I mean, 
it, it's a significant event. So I was still very troubled by there, there being so much that I didn't know. Um, what I didn't find a whole lot of in my reading was firsthand testimonies from survivors who lived through partition. And so one of my first internet searches at my first real job out of law school in the mid nineties, um, at late nineties actually was, I, I was late to adapt to the internet. Um, so late nineties, one of my first internet searches was partition. I was trying to find people's stories. Um, and I found a lot of newspaper articles from that time. Um, most of them had a very you know, political bent to them. They talked a lot about you know, the, the key political figures and the violence, but I was really looking for more stories, but I couldn't really find any online. So for the next several years, I still continued to read book after book. Eventually I uh, quit law and started writing nonfiction. I started reading parent, writing parenting articles and um, later criticism and had some children. Um, Again, still never thinking that I will write about partition. Hadn't even crossed my mind. Um, and uh, then uh, after 15 years of reading about partition, um, my family and I just were uh, decided to go to India for my cousin's wedding. And it was my first time visiting India in 19 years. I was taking my husband and it would be his first visit as well as my three young daughters and my parents. And we decided to, uh, we hadn't been in so long, we decided to be tourists and uh, we landed in Delhi and then made a trip to Agra. And uh, we went to Agra to see the Taj Mahal. When I got to the Taj Mahal with my family, um, it was sunset and I was standing on the Western side of the terrace and I was looking out over the Yamuna River and I was looking at, at the mosque and then in the distance Agra Fort. I was basically standing in the very same position that Sean is standing in the scene that I just read. And the last time I was standing in that spot, I had been with my grandmother, my father's mother, who I called Ava, who had died about uh, five or six years earlier. And this was my first trip to India since she passed away. And so I was just overcome with sadness and with longing for her in that moment. Um, and I felt very strongly, I felt her presence very strongly there. And then I had this image in my mind of a granddaughter and a grandmother who were separated and could not be together. Mm. And by the time we returned from India back to uh, Atlanta, three weeks later, I had an idea for this novel in partition that would also center around a grandmother and a granddaughter mm -hmm. who are apart, who in fact are completely estranged from one another. And, uh, and at the beginning of the novel, neither one of them has any impulse to even reunite. I mean, they are living their lives separately. Sean doesn't really know or care what she is missing about this side of her family until she endures her own personal tragedies, which is first a pregnancy loss and then the implosion of her marriage. It's not until then that she starts asking questions about this whole side of her family that she doesn't know anything about. Um, so, um, so yeah, so uh, it, uh, I always tell people I kind of did the reverse. I did the research for the novel for 15 years before I even thought I would write anything about partition. Yeah. Um, and of course I did a ton of research after, uh, afterward when I got the idea from the novel, but, um, but yeah, it just came from a love of this part of history that I feel like um, not enough people know about. Right, which, which in and of itself is stunning because I think in the book you quote a million deaths, a million deaths. Yes, there are different figures. It's, it's, some people say it's a million, some people say it's between one and two million. It depends on what source you use, but yes, an, just an appalling number of people. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by what you just said about how they don't even know what they're missing. Like they don't long for each other because they're so absent in each other's lives. And I wanted to talk about how in the book, there is 
the thing that you were searching for in real life, this partition project where stories do get told. And, um, and I, I found that so interesting and uh, important to, um, for people to come back decades later and talk about their, their stories. And, and I'm wondering if you could just speak to that sort of the importance of telling and what that means um, in so many things, you know, in, in social activism to name, to name the hurt to name the pain and also in this particular book, I'd really love for you to speak to that. Absolutely. Um, so in 2011, after I made my trip to India and I got the idea for uh, writing this novel, I mean, I was, I had still been up until that point using the internet to try to find stories. And, and at that point I was finding survivors testimonies but they were in random places online. I would see a YouTube video that somebody had uploaded about their experiences during partition. I'd find like a random message board where people would be talking about something unrelated to partition, but then you'd see a comment where someone's like, oh yeah, my father lived through this and it was really hard. You know, so I would find like, it was like looking for jigsaw puzzle pieces. I would find something here, find something there. I would save it as a bookmark, but I could not locate any sort of database or archive that, that collected these stories. But 2011, the year I went to India, uh, an organization called the 1947 Partition Archive was born in uh, the Bay Area. Um, and it wasn't the first of them, it was just the first one that I happened to encounter when I was looking online. And I found this organization. They had a Facebook group where they put excerpts of survivor stories uh, in this uh, Facebook page. They had placed them other places online. And I was just so taken aback of the work that they do. Um, and what I would come to know later on was that 60 years, six zero years passed from partition until there was a formal widespread effort to collect survivors' stories. Mm -hmm. And of course, 60 years, I mean, the, the thousands upon thousands of stories we would have lost of survivors in that time, people that had very real memories. And of course, not only did we not have an archive for so long, but um, a lot of folks, just could not, because of the trauma, they could not share their stories. And one of the reasons why these archives are so important, not just to preserve the history of what actually happened, but also because survivors who endure such immense trauma, sometimes they feel safer talking to strangers about it, people they don't know. Historians who are a little bit removed from their personal lives, they may feel safer sharing their stories with those folks, not their siblings or their children or their grandchildren. <clears throat> so these archives play such an important role. And so when I was writing the novel after I discovered the partition archive um, and Gunita uh, Singbala, who is the founder of the archive, which is now, they have people all over the world collecting stories. It's a magnificent organization. She said that the reason she was inspired to start this archive was because she went to a memorial of Hiroshima in Japan and saw this, this, uh, this monument to survivors and nothing like that existed on the subcontinent at the time. Yeah. So I wanted the novel to have at its heart, you know, the lesson that is, it's so important to uh, ask people we love what their childhood was like, what their lives were like, to find out what they may have endured, and to help them find ways to preserve their stories. Um, and, and the archive in the novel I call the Partition Project, and it is loosely based on the Partition Archive, um, is, is there because uh, I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to honor the, the amazing work that these historians do to make sure that we have down this important history. 
Yeah, that it, it's it does feel very important, both in in real life and in and in the book. And you know, as we know, um, people people sometimes, like you said, they don't want to tell their relatives because they have this feeling like it'll be too much for you. But really, it's hard for them to to feel like they're going to inflict their own pain. And so there's a lot of things that are unsaid. And in fact, in, in the book, you have, you, have theme, you, you, you have that theme throughout that um, there's one character in particular who can't speak of what really is, a, what, you know, the, the term unspeakable loss and trauma at age 16, the, the, the main character, Deepa. And, um, and, and, and when people do speak, that there is some healing. And I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an exact formula, like you speak and you're going to feel better, mm -hmm. but there, there is, there can be some healing in feeling like your story matters. And, 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 and so I, I, I thought you did that really, really um, so expertly. And, um, you know, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about, about that character and, sort of um you know what what her what her journey was after after loss and also the the not knowing mm -hmm. you know not knowing what happened to people and what that did to her as well absolutely yeah. so deepa at the beginning of the novel roughly the first third of the novel which is part 1 is her story as a 16 year old in 1947 yeah and Deepa is, she's an only child. She's adored by her parents. She works for them at their medical clinic. And, you know, she's like any other 16 year old. In some respects, she cares about hanging out with her friends. And she begins to fall in love with a boy that, who, who attends the boys school next door. And his name is Amir. And um, she starts to become cognizant at the beginning of the summer of 47 that there are changes afoot and that her life is going to be impacted by them. She feels the sort of tensions uh, around her. She's hearing from her friends who are Muslim. They're going to have to leave Delhi and they're going to have to go to the new uh, country called Pakistan. Um, and so she's starting to experience a lot of anxiety. Um, early on in the novel, there is a uh, a, a, a violent intruder uh, to her parents' clinic. And Deepa is finally faced uh, head on with how people start to change, how people that she was friends with and she adored start to embrace extremism and how this is starting to impact her family's life. She uh, loses everything as a child. And not only does she lose everything, but she is swept up and moved to London uh, in 1947. So not only has she lost everyone important to her in her world, um, she is lost, she's lost her homeland completely. She is now living in a foreign country and trying to come to terms with, with not feeling connected at all to anybody in her previous life. And so it becomes easier for Deepa to pack away her past, to pretend that it didn't happen. Um, and she goes to, to university um, and she builds a career in Europe, um, but she succeeds in not really talking to anybody about what happened to her, including her own son. Um, who is desperate to know who his father was. She won't even talk about his father. And so what I wanted to show in the book was how trauma, how the trauma response of silence, of packing something away, of never talking about it, can be inherited by later generations who don't even know the source of that trauma. I mean, Sean has no idea that her grandmother uh, lived through such a horrific incident in her childhood. She barely knows what partition is. 
And, and what's ironic about that is Sean's entire life sort of ends up being shaped by Deepa's trauma, mm -hmm. even though she, she doesn't even know her grandmother lived through a trauma. She thinks her grandmother just is uninterested and cold hearted and, and just has no care to build a relationship with her. She has no idea what's behind all of that. And because her father died when she was only 11, and because he had abandoned her when she was only five, she wasn't even able to get any information from any Indian family member about what might have happened in the subcontinent. All she knows is that Deepa moved to London when she was a teenager and hasn't been back to India since. So I, I wanted to show how not only knowing our family histories and our stories impacts later generations, right. but how not knowing them also impacts later generations and really shapes their lives. And that, you know, disconnections from ancestry are quite powerful and can show up in the everyday lives of, of even grandchildren. Right. And what's so fascinating to me is that this is this is a, a fictional a fictional book that really reads as nonfiction to me, that those themes, those themes are um, like those characters felt felt absolutely real to me and their pain and what they struggled with and the knowing and the not knowing um, is is very realistic in our in our lives. And I think that's, you know, the best the best fiction that it's that it absolutely seems uh, taken out of, of somebody's, um, somebody's story. And it probably represents little pieces of thousands of people's stories. And I, and I also found it interesting that, um, I think later in life, Deepa is, is a poet, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and I wonder, I wonder as you were writing sort of the decision to allow expression, you know, that, that, People think of poetry as such a such an expression of someone's deepest self to put on the page, and how it was that somebody who was so closed off and so, you know, silent and cold appearing, although it was just an appearance, um, could write could write poetry. I thought that was such an interesting choice, and I'd love to, if you want to speak to that a little bit. Sure. So. Before Deepa is whisked out of India against her will, she does not want to leave India. Um, she has a very close relationship with her teacher at school. And her, her, her teacher at school is also dealing with uh, a lot of stress related to partition. She also has family who is trying to cross the border and, and she hasn't heard from them in a while. And so uh, Deepa and her teacher bond. Um, and Deepa has read some poetry in class and, and, and loves literature, but doesn't feel like she's particularly talented in writing. Um, and, and her teacher tells her, you know, this is writing is a place for healing. This, this, is, this is your opportunity to express yourself and see yourself and be honest with yourself in a way that, you know, it, it's difficult to do uh, in, in other forms. And so this, the writing, the poetry is how Deepa finds a way to manage her grief, not so mm -hmm. much grow out of her grief or heal through her grief, but to just simply manage the day to day of missing mm -hmm. her loved ones and, um, and, and enduring her trauma. Um, and so she does do that uh, in poetry. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, and I, I, I wanted to give Deepa this outlet, um, mm -hmm. but I also wanted to make sure that I didn't romanticize the, the pain that she was going through. Yes. Um, and having her as a poet where she could have that release for herself um, but still in her day to day, have too difficult a time with her trauma and her memories to share them or express them one-on-one yeah. -on -one with someone. Um, that, that was the balance that I was really trying to achieve in writing her character. Yeah, I think you did. I think you did achieve it really, 
beautifully. So thank you for that. Um, I, I, we do have a couple of questions, but I wanna ask you a, a couple more really quickly. Um, one is that I think there are, there are writers who are uh, watching you um, launch two books in six weeks and um, you know, there will be people watching this event app later when, when they're able. And, and I, I think that um, they're all wondering, is my, is my book going to get published? And, you know, what's the process like? And you've recently been um, incredibly generous, I think, in sharing um, a long journey that you had towards publication and the kinds of really um, unhelpful and hurtful things that people said along the way when you were just, you know, really um, writing and writing and writing. And I think you have uh, a few novels uh, to come. Um, and I just, I wonder if you can give them a little bit of, of, of hope and inspiration about, about the process. Sure. Um, so uh, just to give a little bit of a background, um, I have been writing books for roughly 20 years, um, but it took me 11 years of sending out what's called a query letter where you, you try to pique the interest of an agent. Um, it took me 11 years of doing that for multiple books, seven books, before I received my first book contract. So it took me a long time. So from the time I started trying to get one of my books published, to the time that the book was published was about 13 years total. So it was a long journey for me. So when I think about advice, the first thing that jumps to my mind is find your writing community, find people who will love you and nurture you through this process, who will, um, who will, uh, you know, be hold you accountable when you when you're not writing when you're feeling discouraged who will give you that sort of tough love where they were like okay we understand this is disappointing that you keep getting rejected but where's that next chapter you know what's what's happening in that book um i would not have had a book published if it wasn't for my writing community they they kept me on course they were my cheerleaders i couldn't have done it without them but I think my second piece of advice is to remember that your value as a writer comes in your writing, in your commitment to the craft, not necessarily to, to uh, publication or bylines. Publishing is different than writing. It's not the same thing. Right. So value what you do as a writer because you are writing. Value because of how you, uh, how you write, how you create characters, how you tell your own stories and try to keep that separate from the publishing industry, which is random and publishing happens oftentimes via chance. And it's not necessarily a merit-based system. It's not like the very best writers are the ones who get the book contracts. Um, it happens, it's, it's about really whether your book moves the person who, uh, who has the decision-making power of whether to publish your book um, at that time. So, um, so try to keep your devotion and your love of writing and your, your uh, constant work of writing different, uh, separate from, from uh, publishing, which is uh, an industry that you have no control over anyways. Thank you so much for saying that. And I find it helpful. I find it helpful to hear. Um, I think that all of us get caught up in, um, in all kinds of things related to writing and, and publishing. And, and remembering, remembering that you're writing to write as opposed to what external people are saying or, or um, you know, what their opinion of your book may not be the opinion that you actually want. So I, I, I really appreciate, I really appreciate you saying that. And I just wanna quickly uh, read uh, the epigraph to Southbound, because I think it, it I want to say something about you here. It says, uh, either way, change will come. It could be bloody or it could be beautiful. It depends on us. And, and um, I just want to say that, you know, 
for those of you who are uh, hopefully right now ordering Anjali's uh, two books, um, that your values um, and your hard work and your activism uh, are seen both in Southbound and The Parted Earth. And I think that it is part of what makes the books so compelling and so gorgeous. So I just, um, yeah. just want to, you're welcome and thank you. Um, so I want to I, I want to just turn to a couple of questions, and we have about ten or fifteen minutes if people want to add some. Um, so the first one is of the novels you've read about partition, which ones are closest to your heart? Oh, I love that. Okay, <laughs> so there are there are a couple. Of, well, first of all, there are many novels that were close to my heart, but I I will I I will uh, talk about a few of them. Um, so I love Cracking India, which is by Bubsy Sidwa. It was originally called Ice Candy Man. Um, and uh, Bubsy Sidwa is a survivor of partition. And she writes this novel from the perspective of an eight-year-old named Lenny, um, who uh, has a disability and whose uh, nanny gets kidnapped. And that's the, that's the impetus for uh, Lenny to understand you know what is happening that's when it really really hits home for her um and so i thought a lot about how she told this story of this huge event from the eyes of a child and even though deepa is 16 years old that book really helped me see that you know children are still very much interested in their insular world and um are not necessarily conscious of everything that's happening outside of their household so I thought she did that um, very, very well. Um, and um, and uh, so that's definitely one of them. So um, uh, Train to Pakistan is the classic by Kushwant Singh. This, is, this was published in 1956 um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it tells the story of a, of a village that soon gets caught up in the communal strife and the violence of partition. Um, and um, uh, Kushwant had to escape himself. He drove himself, um, I think, to India and settled eventually in Delhi and ended up being actually a, a, a renowned uh, journalist. Wow. Um, and what was wonderful about him is that he lived a very long time to age uh, in his 90s, I think. Mm. Um, and he lived long enough to see a museum built uh, for, for partition. Um, so that's another one. Um, you know, there's a third one that I love that is actually uh, more recent. Well, there are many more that I love, but I'll just say this last one, which is Partitions by Amit Majum, Ma, sorry, Majmudar. Um, and uh, he's a poet, so he has beautiful language. And he talks about, um, it, the, the story resolves around these six-year-old twins and uh, a random doctor that they meet and a random teenager. Um, and, and, and they're of different faiths and they all come upon each other as they are escaping as refugees. Um, and, uh, and the story is told from the, the twins deceased father. Um, so I, I loved that, that sort of point of view, this father kind of understands what's going on, um, you know, more than the, the six year old twins do. Um, so those are, those are three of them. Um, there are so many others though that are so wonderful out there. Okay, well, that's great. Those, those, I'm going to put those right on my list as well. And um, let me pull up the next question. Are there any pieces of history that you left out of the book that you find interesting? Oh my goodness, yes, <laughs> so much. You know, I cover in roughly 250 pages, uh, 70 years. So I would say that this is, this novel is like, one tenth of one percent of what happened during a uh, partition. And of course, it takes place uh, in the Northwest frontier on that border, right? But there is, of course, another border, which uh, is the border between India and what is East Pakistan, which I don't touch at all. Um, there's, of course, a really unique and interesting story about Hyderabad, what happened. This was uh, under Muslim control during partition and uh, didn't want to cede to India until 1948 when the mm. Indian army came in and forced them to. 
Um, so there are so many stories related to partition and um, I, you know, I really hope that with the archives out there and other writers coming up that we get to hear uh, that we get to read so many more uh, novels or even yeah. nonfiction books about it. I do too, I do too. Um, okay, here's, here's another one. Do you see this trickle down trauma in many descendants of partition survivors? Absolutely. So um, I have so many friends who have told me, so, so my, I should clarify, my Indian family was not impacted by partition because they live, they lived in the South, um, uh, in Chennai at the time. So, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, these are not my stories. However, um, I'm, I'm close to quite a few people who either are from, uh, whose family history was either uh, originally in East Pakistan or Pakistan or the part that is India, and then they had to flee to Pakistan, who all they know is uh, that something bad happened to them or their loved ones and that it happened during partition. And I've talked to many of them, they express a lot of regret from never getting to hear those stories, from wishing that they knew more. They can't tell what is fact and what has become folk folklore. Um, and so uh, I tried to capture in, that, in the novel that same kind of regret about what happened. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think shame it has been such a powerful force in having partition survivors um, be honest about their uh, stories, even though, of course, it was not their fault and they had nothing to do with with the violence. They still feel like that there was more they could do for perhaps a loved one who was injured or who, or who was killed. Um, so um, I, I think this is this is a, a very big uh, issue that affects people who have roots in South Asia that were near any uh, of the borders at the time. Yeah, and I, I think that helplessness and violence, um, you know, you can say rationally they shouldn't lead to shame, but they do, mm -hmm. and guilt. And um, so a friend of mine just wrote a, a, a beautiful story um, about just feeling guilt and helplessness about what's happening in India right now. And, um, and sort of the feeling like, you know, and, and of course I'm talking about the catastrophe related to COVID and yes. yeah. And, and I, I just, I, I guess I, I, I wouldn't have felt right not bringing it up because although it's a different catastrophe, what, what we're hearing is that, you know, people are, are losing so many people overnight in a, in a, in a, in a town, in a village, in a, mm -hmm. in a community, and they don't feel like there's much they can do to, to, to stop it or be helpful. And, um, and I'm just wondering, you know, in your work as an activist, and then in writing these two books, um, I imagine that this is also having, that it it, your thoughts are with, are, are with, people there. Absolutely. I mean, I have friends who have lost five, six, seven, eight people. Um, most of my family, I do have family in India. Um, we do know of someone who passed away last weekend Sorry. in Delhi. Um, uh, but my family um, uh, right now is safe. I actually have very few family members living in India. Mm -hmm. Most of my generation um, uh, moved to other countries in the world. Um, but um, I, uh, I have been very much keeping up with uh, news in the subcontinent for many years. Yes. I understand the political party in power. Um, I've been very outspoken about the type of government that India has uh, had for several years now. Um, I'm trying to be careful so I don't end up getting uh, my social media accounts turned off because um, yeah. that is happening right now. But I have been um, uh, 
I, I have been speaking out against the government for years now uh, that's in India and, um, and highlighting what's happening to dissenters there. Um, I have many friends who are uh, journalists in the subcontinent, who are activists, um, whose work that I support. Um, and I've been doing what I can to amplify them. And COVID is essentially, uh, it, it, it is, um, you know, it, it is basically the, the, the last straw. What was in place with the government um, and then to have COVID, it was like yeah. a, it was like a train, two trains colliding, yeah. uh, unfortunately, and it's absolutely uh, horrific. I, yeah. I, uh, I, 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 the first hour of every day, I'm reading. Uh, uh, I subscribe to uh, Indian uh, uh, newspapers, um, and that's when I read uh, the latest of what's happening there, um, and. Um, you know, there are wonderful mutual aid organizations. Yes. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're spreading the word online about what they need and how we can donate. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm so afraid of what's happening there. I'm so afraid um, and I worry the worst is yet to come. Um, this morning I was reading an article in The Guardian that Nepal has a 45% positivity rate um, and Nepal doesn't even have the kinds of resources um, that India has. So I'm, I'm so fearful of not just India, but all the South Asian countries who are going to be affected now uh, and already being affected by what's happening to India. And, and, I, and I, I hope that resources that being are, sent, are being sent to the country are actually making it to the hospitals and the healthcare providers and, and the people who are sick. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very afraid about what about what's to come. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to just say that it is really, um, we still in our world don't see what happens somewhere as like that it's, it's happening to everybody. If it's happening mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, it's, it's all of our responsibility. And, um, and we don't, we don't think that way enough. I, this week in the in the globe there was an article by somebody i don't know i i and i i don't usually you know openly criticize in this particular way but it had some it had a headline like um we should care about what's happening in india because it'll affect us economically like yeah. literally, remember and and there are reasons we should care about what's happening in the world because we should care about humanity and i and i feel like um your books make that point really plain. Like, and by plain, I mean directly. You know, really directly. In both books, I talk yeah. a lot about borders, right? Yeah. I mean, borders are borders are fiction, right? Yeah. The, the line that was drawn between the new nations of India and Pakistan were made up. Um, the line between the north and the south that I write about in Southbound, it's made up yeah. um borders are created uh for political reasons mm -hmm. to keep a dominant culture ethnicity religion race in power that's why they're that's why they exist yeah. they they exist to hoard power and yeah. borders have have succeeded in destroying so much of our humanity yeah and just like you mentioned, right, with the article that, you know, how can we even really think about COVID happening somewhere else when right. it's a virus? I mean, it just right. goes where it wants to go. It just gets right. a host and then it spreads. Right. So if we can't understand during COVID yeah. how meaningless borders really are and how, how hurtful and how damaging they really are, and how much oppression and suffering they cause. I don't know when we'll understand it because mm -hmm. um, you know, we are all one people and it's, it's, if anything has, should have made that clear, it's a global pandemic that mm -hmm. we've been in for 14, almost 15 months now. Um, 
So I, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, and it's it's something that um, has always interested me is is how much stock we put in to these fictional lines that we have drawn uh, on the globe, right? In the excerpt I read, I mentioned latitudes and longitudes. Um, people take those to heart, and <laughs> I know they do. They shouldn't. They, sh they shouldn't, and a lot of harm has has been done in the name of. I mean, I really, I, I love the way you said that, that borders are fictional and that somebody invents them and says, well, now this is mine and don't go, don't step over this line. But the line isn't, isn't real. It's not real. It's yeah. not. And we still have, I mean, we, we still have folks being detained at the U.S.-Mexico border. Yes, we do. And, and, and why? I mean, it, 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 it. Yeah doesn't really make sense when we stop to think about them. They, they mm -hmm. have done more harm than good. And, um, and you know, I, I hope maybe that's one of the messages that come out of these books is, is to sort of rethink this idea we have of, of why we have these, these lines that separate people. Well, I, so I, it really was a, a point of personal privilege for me to bring, bring this up and I appreciate you, um, I appreciate you having this conversation with me. I think I, I respect, um, I respect your the work that you do uh, as as a as an activist and and in social justice. And I, I, I really appreciate it. And I really do want to tell. I, hi now. I really do want to tell the readers again that um, you know, Anjali is the is the real deal, both as as a writer and as a human. And I really hope that you will read both of these books whoops hold on <laughs> both of these books I had them upside down um, they're extraordinary and I just feel like it was such a privilege to spend some time with you uh, talking about your books and the world and the ways they are interconnected so uh, Nell do you want to take Thank Angela, you. You want I, to yes. I want to jump in and say please please also get Michelle's book is rape a crime if you haven't read it already I had the immense privilege of reviewing it for the Boston Globe and it is absolutely exquisite um, and part of the reason why I was so excited to talk with Michelle is because these themes of trauma are actually very similar in our books um, so please get Michelle's book and thank you Michelle um, you are such a dear human being and um, I'm so thrilled that we got to talk together for this same and thank you and thank you Nell I don't know if you want to yes. send us off <laughs> yes absolutely thank you, um, Nell, and uh, thank you well, for, everyone for attending <laughs> uh thanks thank you so much to both of you for this really beautiful and and enlivening and enlightening conversation and thanks to those of you who are joining us and again I've reposted the link in the chat to learn more and to purchase copies of this beautiful book at harvard.com and on behalf of harvard bookstore in in cambridge mass i just thank you all for joining us thanks to both of you again michelle and angeli and you. uh please take care stay safe thanks thank everyone you, everybody bye-bye thank bye, you bye angeli bye now thank you so bye. much bye